Hi, I am Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, I would like to continue uh, discussing certain topics related to quantity and cardinality of sets. Um, and uh, I would like to present these topics as the set of problems which I would like actually you to try to solve yourself first. Um, and, uh, and right now I'll present my own solutions, opinions about these problems. Um, they are actually quite important to understand uh, what actually the quantity as a concept, as a philosophical concept, if you wish, really is. Um, uh, from the mathematical standpoint, it's a very good exercise, actually, um, because it really lies in between the mathematics and, and philosophy, if you wish, because we're talking about infinity. Most, most of these problems are related to infinity, because the finite sets, they are kind of simple, and the quantity as a concept is very, very simple. It's just a number of elements, no big deal. Um, but as far as the infinities are concerned, well, this is a little tricky. So uh, try to spend some time yourself just thinking about these problems, uh, trying to offer your own solutions, and, uh, and here is what I think about it. Okay, problem number one. Prove that cardinality of a set of all integer numbers is equal to the cardinality of a set of all natural numbers. Okay, so... Uh, all integer numbers are... Uh, I'll do it like this. So it's from minus infinity to zero to plus infinity. These are all integer numbers, positive and negative. Now, the natural numbers are 1, 2, 3, etc. So, my task is to find one-to-one -one correspondence between these two sets. Okay, um, I think something which really uh, quite natural in this particular case is start from the center. And let's try to find uh, the corresponding uh, natural number for all the integer, but we will start from the center and then we will go left and right, le left and right in both directions. So, zero, so this is integers and this is natural numbers. So, zero will correspond to one then 1 will correspond to 2, minus 1 will correspond to 3. I'll use plus. So plus 2 will correspond to 4, minus 2 will correspond to 5. Now, will we find for every integer number, positive or negative, using this technique, the corresponding natural number? Yes. The answer is yes, because for every integer number, sooner or later we will find its place in this particular sequence. Plus 3 minus 3 plus 4 minus 4. So eventually we will reach any number, uh, integer number, positive or negative. And since we have plenty of numbers, actually infinite number of numbers, we will definitely find... Uh, the corresponding natural number for to the integer which we are looking for. So what we can all, uh, what, what, what we can say right now is that the correspondence, a unique correspondence from the set of all integer numbers to a set of all natural numbers exists. Since for each integer we can find the corresponding natural. Now, how about in reverse? Well, the simplest thing which I can do right now is say that since natural numbers are a subset of integer numbers, then it's definitely for each natural number there is an integer which is basically the same number. For 1, 1, for 2, 2, for 25, 25, etc. 
it will not cover all the integer numbers, but that's not actually required. Uh, the one-to-one -one correspondence is not necessarily uh, working both ways. Uh, it can work one way uh, using one rule and another way using another rule. At the same time, now this is a simpler approach. Now, at, at the same time, a more complicated approach would be to find the one-to-one -one correspondence, which is bidirectional, which means every image uh, can be as a source, and then the source can be an image of that element. Now, how to do this? Well, let's just think about some kind of formula which we can come up with. So from zero, again, back to integers and natural. From zero, we have one. Plus one, we have two. Minus one, we have three. Plus two, we have four. Minus two, we have five. Well, if you see for every um, positive number, uh, the corresponding nature would be twice as big. So this is basically the rule. Uh, so for each positive, so for zero, it's one. For each positive number, it is it's double, and for each negative number, it's double, um, negated. If minus one double would be minus two, if we negate it will be two, and plus one. So this is the formula. And it's actually reversible. So in this particular case, it's uh, y is equal to 2x for x greater than 0, and y is equal to minus 2x plus 1 if x is less than 0. So that's basically the rule. Now. Um, and y is equal to 1 for x equals to 0. All right, so is it reversible? Well, it is. Because these are even numbers. These are odd numbers. So for every even number, I can say you have to divide it uh, by 2 to get the corresponding integer. And for every odd uh, natural number, you have to subtract 1, you get the even, then reverse the sign, so you will get minus, and then divide by 2. So basically, this is the formulas which establish <coughs> excuse me, the one-to-one -one correspondence, which is not only one-to-one -one correspondence, but is a, a, a reversible or inversible one-to-one -one correspondence. When the source of the image is the original source. All right, so that's it for this first um, problem. It's uh, a little bit, maybe, too lengthy an explanation. Um, when you basically get a grip of it, you, you will find it's much easier. First of all, I did not have to go through the second part um, to establish the correspondence between natural numbers and, 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 and all integers, because I know that since natural numbers can be mapped into integers just in a natural way, with, 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 with an equation, basically. What's the corresponding for 5? Five? 5. What's the corresponding for, definite, for, for 25? 25. What was important is to find the correspondence between the, so to speak, bigger. I will use this word bigger, but it's not really a valid word in this case. But anyway, seemingly bigger set which is integers, to uh, its subset, which is natural numbers. If we establish the correspondence between a set and its subset, then you don't have to really go in reverse, because the reverse obviously exists with this natural mapping of subset into set. OK, number two. Prove that set of all integers, integer numbers divisible by 7 is countable. 
In other words, its cardinality is the same as cardinality of set of all natural numbers. So again, we have uh, integer numbers, but not all of them. We have 0, 7, minus 7, 14, minus 14, etc. Or if you wish, I can put it like minus 7, 0, plus 7, to, to, to extend to both left and right infinities. Well, well, actually, the way how I have written it right now, this is already a map. It's a correspondence between, between these numbers, all integer numbers, which I have written in this particular sequence, and natural numbers. This is the correspondence. So once I can enumerate them, I will use just yet another word, enumerate. Um, once you enumerate the elements, it means actually you have put them into the correspondence with the, the all the natural numbers. Now, how can I get uh, a formula, if you wish? Uh, well, let's think about it. Mm. For for 7, you get 2. So, um, you have to subtract. So, what's the next one? For 28, you get 6. And for minus 28, for minus 28. Okay, let me just write it this way. So, for 0, you get 1. For 7, you get 2. For minus 7, you get 3. For 14, you get 4. For minus 14, you get 5. For 28, you get 6. And for minus 28, you get 7. All right, so what's the, what's the law? What's the rule here? Can I establish it using some kind of a formula? Um, well, you probably have to divide it by So let's talk again positive and negative separately because we know that every negative is the next after the previous positive. So we can just Ignore this one and consider this. 7, 2, 14, 4, 28, 6. So these are going with... Uh, oh, I forgot 21, sorry. This is 21, not 28. That's what actually... Something which I missed. So these are going up by 7, and these are going up by 2. So to get it, you have to what divide it by 7 and multiply by 2. That's what it is. So the formula is... Divide by 7 and multiply by 2. 4 x greater than 0. From 7, we get 7 by 7 times 2. For 14, you get 14 by 7, 2 times 2, 2. And for 21, we get 3 times 2, 6. Okay, so for positive, we have this. For negative, it will be well, you have to change it to a corresponding positive sign, also divided by 7 and multiply by 2, and add 1. That's how you get, instead of 2, you get 3, instead of 4, you get 5, etc. So this is 4x less than 0. So this is an attempt to go by formula. But again, I really don't have to do this. What's actually enough is just write it down one under another and obviously you see what what's the principle 
of one-to-one uh, -one correspondence. So in the future, I'll try to avoid all these uh, formulas because it's not really needed. What is needed just to demonstrate the idea, and the formula can be derived, uh, you can derive it yourself without any problems. Prove that cardinality of a set of all integer numbers is equal to a cardinality of all rational numbers. Now, this is much more interesting and, quite frankly, less obvious. You have all the integer numbers on one side and all the rational numbers, a significantly, well, bigger, I'll use again the word bigger, a significantly bigger set, uh, and obviously integer numbers um, can be a subset of, of rational numbers, because every, ratio, uh, every integer number, every integer number x can be represented as a rational number x over 1. So we obviously have a mapping from integers to rational numbers. So for different, so we have every, in, uh, every integer number will have its image among rational and obviously different integer numbers will have different images. Uh, so from integer to rational is easy. But how about from rational to integers? Now this is not as easy. And, uh, and again, obviously there are many different ways to do it. But let me just offer something which I well, consider important. Um, here is how. First of all, let's consider uh, only positive numbers separately from negative numbers, uh, since we know that rational numbers can be positive and negative, and integer numbers can be positive and negative. So what I will do is, for rational number 0, I will map it to an integer number 0. For everything which is greater than 0, I will map them into integer. Now, this is rational, and this is integer. So I will map them into the uh, positive integers. And negative rational numbers, I will map to negative uh, integer numbers in exactly the same way as positive. So I will talk about only positive numbers, OK? Only positive relative, uh, rational numbers I have to map into, into integers. Now, how can I do it? OK, what is a rational number? Rational number is. Uh, basically positive rational number, by the way. It's two positive integer numbers uh, with uh, uh, something like a separator, if you wish. I don't want to say it's a division. But whatever it is, sign of division or a separator, because I can always put it this way as a rational number. Basically, any rational number is uh, a set of two integer numbers. Now, we're talking about positive rational numbers, so we're talking about two positive integer numbers. doesn't matter how I write it down. But here is how I would like to map this set, set of all these pairs of integer, positive integer numbers, into uh, a set of integer numbers. OK, uh, here is how. I will use the term. Uh, weight. It's the sum of these two. Now, how many positive rational numbers exist with uh, weight 1? Well, actually, none, because 0 over 1 is equal to 0. It's not positive. And 1 over 0 does not exist because you cannot have a rational number with a 0 as a denominator. OK, how about with weight equals 2? Well, we have only one rational number with weight equals to two, uh, which is equal to 2, 1, 1. Now, for weight equal to 3, I have actually 2 rational numbers, but finite, mind you. I always have a finite number of rational numbers with a specific weight. For weight number 4, for weight equals to 4, I have 1 third, 2 second, and 
three firsts. So I have three. Well, obviously, the number, as the numbers grow, I will eventually find any rational number among these. But in this particular case, I can enumerate them because I can put the corresponding number of this to 1 as an integer, positive integer number. These will be mapped to 2 and 3. These will be mapped in 4, 5, and 6, etc. So what I would like to point here is that for every rational number, eventually I will come to a line which will state that its weight is such and such. For instance, rational number m over n, my weight will be m plus n. So eventually I will come up to this. And eventually it will find its number, because I have an infinite number of integer, positive integer numbers, so eventually it will come to uh, some kind of a number of, of this particular rational number. Now this integer number is its image. So that's how I put into the correspondence all rational numbers to positive rational numbers to all positive integer numbers. Now, same thing with negative, obviously, and that's how the whole relationship is established. So for every rational number, I can always find uh, the corresponding integer number, which means that uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between all rational numbers and its subset, uh, which is integers. Now, by the way, I, I don't know about you, but first time when I thought about this and somebody actually showed me that the number of rational numbers is exactly the same, or I shouldn't, I shouldn't say the number is the same, the cardinality of uh, the set of all rational numbers is exactly the same as the cardinality of um, all natural numbers or all integer numbers, whatever, they're all the same anyway. Uh, I was kind of surprised. All right. Now let's talk about something a little bit more uh, interesting. Prove that cardinality of a set of all points of a segment does not depend on its lengths. In other words, cardinality of a set of all points of a short segment is exactly the same as cardinality of a set of all points of a longer segment. So we have two different segments. This is a long segment. This is a short segment. Now. How can I build the one-to-one -one correspondence between these points and these points? Well, it's actually very easy. <laughs> Here it is. Since this is shorter than this, I will connect this to this. So they will cross somewhere. And this is a very important point. Every line which I draw would signify a correspondence between this and this. Now, every, every point in the longer segment, let's say this, can find its image in a shorter segment by connecting to this center. This is an image. And vice versa, every point on the short segment using the line will find a unique uh, image uh, in the short segment. Obviously, different points will correspond to different points in the image, both directions. So this actually proves that the cardinality of this set and cardinality of this set are the same, since there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. And this is the way how I build the correspondence. Again, it's maybe a little bit counter counterintuitive, just a little bit, that there is the same number, I mean, using uh, a, a, a common language, not the mathematical language, that uh, both longer and, and shorter segments have the same number of points. But, again, they are the same because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. <clears throat> That's an interesting property of, of infinity. Things which are not necessarily 
seem to be equal to each other, they still have the same number of elements. Okay, prove that cardinality of a set of all points of an arc is equal to cardinality of a set of all points of a chord between the ends. So if you have an arc and you have a chord, now this is obviously part of the circle. Uh, then the number of points here and the number of points here, these are two sets, and uh, this particular problem says that the number of points have the same cardinality in both cases. Well, again, we used to think that the straight uh, line is shorter than anything else. Yes, it is shorter from the length perspective, <clears throat> but from the perspective of one-to-one -one correspondence, these two sets have exactly the same cardinality because we can build a one-to-one -one correspondence. Well, there are many ways to build the correspondence. One way is to use the center, for instance, and draw these lines. These lines establish the correspondence. Different uh, points on, on the arc would correspond to different uh, images uh, on a segment, and vice versa, different images on the segment will correspond to different uh, points on the arc. Is this the only way to build this correspondence? Well, no. You can have, for instance, perpendicular lines. All the perpendicular lines to a, to a, to a chord. They also establish the one-to-one -one correspondence between points on the arc and points on the chord. So these are different ways, but whatever the way you choose, both establish a, a bidirectional one-to-one -one correspondence, um, which is actually completely reversible, which means the image of this would be an image of that if you go to different, into opposite direction. So these numbers, the uh, cardinality of this set and, and cardinality of this set are the same. They're equal to each other. Prove that cardinality of a set of all points of an interval is equal to cardinality of set of all points of a straight line. Okay. Now, first of all, now this is even a bigger contrast. I'm talking about interval, which is basically a segment without both ends, and a straight line. How to build um, the correspondence between these two sets. Um, well, our original idea, when I had a shorter segment and a longer segment, I just connected the ends and used that as a center. Here it's not really so easy. However, what I can do is a slightly different, a slightly modified, I have a two steps correspondence. Remember the transitivity? If a uh, is in one-to-one -one correspondence with B, and B is in one-to-one -one correspondence with C, then A and C also have one-to-one -one correspondence. So, I'm not going from here to here directly. What I will do first, I will make a semicircle here. Also, no end points here. This is the center. Now, we know that the cardinality of this set and cardinality of this set are exactly the same. So, instead of proving for a segment, or interval rather, I will use the semicircle. Now, with semicircle is a little easier because I can use its center. Now, I presume that this diameter is parallel to this line. I can position it the way how I want, basically. So I position it in such a way that diameter is parallel. Now, uh, there are no endpoints here, right? So I don't really need this diameter. I'm just stating that this will be parallel to a line. Now, I will do this. This is my mapping. This is my one-to-one -one correspondence. And as you see, 
the further my point is on the plane, uh, 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 on the line, the closer my image would be here, or vice versa. Again, this is a one-to-one -one correspondence between all points uh, on the line and points on an arc without these endpoints. I don't need endpoints because the line would be parallel, would not cross anything. So these points will not actually correspond to anything. But all other points, so the whole arc without these two edges, for each point on the arc, I can find the corresponding point on the line and vice versa. Next. Um, prove that cardinality of a set of all points in the plane is equal to cardinality of all sets of points in a straight line. Okay, now this is also something which is kind of not really very obvious. You have all points on the plane and uh, all points on one line. The first seems to be significantly bigger than another, but apparently their cardinality is the same, and that's what I'm going to prove. Look at it this way. What is a point on, on the plane? The point on the plane can be characterized by actually two points, by projections on coordinate axis, right? So instead of considering all points on the plane, I will consider all pair of points on two lines. So what I can say right now already that the number of points on the plane, the cardinality actually of the points on the plane, is equal to cardinality of points on two lines. Okay, that seem, seem, seems to be my, my, much easier, right? So instead of all the points on the plane, you have only points on two lines. And they have to prove that the number of points on two lines is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the number of points on one line. Well, this is easier. Now, how to do this? Well, consider it this way. For instance, I can uh, reflect back to a couple of previous problems. Number of points on the plane, uh, or, sorry, on, on, on the line, is uh, equivalent one-to-one -one correspondence with a uh, number of points in, uh, in an interval, right? So two lines give me two intervals. And number of points in two intervals obviously is equal to number of points in some interval because I can always just put them one to another having a bigger, actually, interval and bigger and smaller interval are always uh, equivalent to each other as far as cardinality is concerned. So I'm referring back to, to these previous problems which I have solved, and that's how I prove that the number of points on the plane is equal to number of points on two lines, which in turn equals to number of points in two intervals, which in turn uh, equal to one particular interval, which in turn equal to one line. So I'm switching from two lines to one using intervals. Okay, so that seems to be easy, although might be unexpected. Prove that cardinality of a set of all infinite sequences of zeros and ones is greater than the cardinality of a set of natural numbers. Okay, um, we have a set of sequences. We have two characters, 0 and 1, and we have different sequences of 0 and 1. This is one sequence. This is another sequence, etc. Now, all these sequences, infinite sequences, by the way, all these sequences uh, make up a set, a set of all sequences. Now, the statement of this problem is that this set is more numerous than the set of natural numbers, which means if I will try to enumerate them, this is number 1, this is number 2, etc., this is number n, etc., if I will try to enumerate them, I will not be able to do this. Well, how? 
Very easy, actually. There is something which is... Um, uh, it's a kind of a trick, actually. Uh, one of the famous uh, mathematicians, Cantor, actually came up with this trick. He says, okay, let's assume that we can actually write one sequence under another and enumerate them, which means put them into correspondence with natural numbers. Let's assume. Now, what I'm going to prove that there is one particular sequence which is not included into this enumeration. So, no matter how we try to enumerate them, there is always one sequence which is not part of this enumeration, which means that we cannot actually place into one-to-one -one correspondence set of all the sequences and natural numbers. Now, how to find which sequence is not among these? Very simply. Take the first sequence and take the first number, which is zero in this particular case, and reverse it. Now, from the um, element number two, take the second uh, uh, number in this sequence and reverse it. From the element number three, you take the third one and reverse it, etc., etc. So you go diagonally, and from each sequence, you take the element. Uh, on the nth place, whatever, if sequence has a, a, a number n, corresponds to natural number n, take the nth element in the sequence and reverse it. And that's how you build a new sequence of zeros and ones. And what's interesting is, it's different from the first uh, sequence because I could change the first element. It's different from the second because in the second place it's different. It's different from any nth element because on the nth place I have reversed from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0. So it's different from any one of those, which means it's not part of the sequence. So this new uh, element of my set, a new sequence of zeros and ones, is actually not part of this enumeration, no matter how tricky I try to enumerate uh, all, all these sequences. So it's not countable. Countable means can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence with natural numbers, so the number of all sequences is not countable. And what's, that, what's very interesting, actually, is let's think about what each sequence might represent. It actually might represent a real number written in binary system. So, uh, Every real number can be represented as uh, finite or infinite, periodic or aperiodic uh, 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 either decimal or binary or, or in any other numerical system written uh, sequence of characters. In this case, I'm representing in uh, the sequence of zeros and ones, which means it's binary actually. And what's interesting here is that the number of different sequences of zeros and ones, which basically represents the, the number of real numbers, is, uh, is not countable. I cannot put it into one-to-one -one correspondence with natural numbers. So rational numbers, if you remember one of the previous problems which we discussed, is actually countable. Remember the weight, uh, numerator plus denominator? And that's how we counted it. With, um, with infinite sequences of zeros and ones, uh, we cannot count them. No matter how well we count, we can always find something which is not part of our uh, counted set. So that's actually a, a proof, albeit not exactly like 100% uh, rigorous, but it's kind of a proof that real numbers are not countable. There are much more, if you wish, again, using the regular language, there are much more non-rational real numbers than, ratio, uh, than rational real numbers. Well, this concludes this particular um, set of problems. I hope you have a better feel of what 
infinity actually is, and there are different infinities, like infinity of the real numbers is significantly greater than, than infinity of rational numbers, which is the same as infinity of natural numbers. All right, um, fine, uh, enough about infinities. Uh, don't forget, uh, unizor.com is a great source for, for um, all these uh, uh, educational materials. And, uh, and, and a very good, actually, tool for parents and uh, supervisors uh, to control the educational process of their students. Thank you very much, and good luck.